Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. In the 16th century, the church practice of indulgence had become corrupted. People were charging money in exchange for the forgiveness of sins. The leaders of the church were abusing God's gift of grace for profit. Meanwhile, a monk named Martin Luther, a theologian of the scriptures, was questioning his personal salvation. He struggled to understand the scripture in Romans 1, 16 through 17. Paul proclaims the good news of God's justice, saving us by his grace, not by what we have done. As he studied the passage, he first understood the gospel message that God forgives sins through faith. This new understanding contradicted what he saw practiced in the church. In 1517, he wrote these differences in 95 Theses, which challenged the church he loved to rethink their actions. This marked the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. This movement changed our views on justification, the authority of scripture, and church leadership. People's views of God were no longer limited to fear and judgment, but expanded to see him as comforter and savior. Well, good morning, how are you? Glad you're here and welcome to the online uh, audience. We're glad you're participating with us. We are commemorating the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, pretty significant. Um, Sharon and I started this church 23 years ago. Many people have come to Christ. Many of you here have, uh, you found faith here in, in, in Christ at this church. So in a way, I am your spiritual father. Well, Martin Luther is our churches like great, 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 great grandfather. There's a lot of what we do, maybe most of what we do, it we do because of his influence. Some people have a calling to be an influence uh, to their generation. That would be uh, all of us. But some people have even a greater calling where they influence generations and future generations. This certainly was Martin Luther's calling. So we're going to look at him and talk about him. And not to be confused with Martin Luther King, uh, I mentioned to a couple of people as we were ramping up to this, I was going to be talking to Martin Luther. They said, oh yeah, I was a great civil rights leader. I, no, no, they're, they're actually different. Uh, however, Martin Luther King was named after Martin Luther. He was actually born Michael King. And then when he was five years old, his dad was influenced by Martin Luther. And so he changed Michael King's name to Martin Luther King Jr. But Martin Luther King, this, this reformer, 500 years ago, uh, really uh, stepped up, did something that nobody else had even was even thinking about as far as we know, and, uh, and really changed the, uh, uh, the, the, the way the church responded and really influenced uh, eternities, all church history. Uh, it's a pivotal point, and so it's worth just looking at some of what he did. You see, uh, he got very frustrated uh, with some of the things that the church was doing at that time. One thing in particular was called the selling of indulgences. What that meant was, was that there was this concept of this idea called purgatory, which was kind of like hell, but it was like, it had a term, li it was like term life insurance, you know, it has like a term to it. It was like a term hell insurance thing where you went for a few thousand years of being in this fiery torment uh, to pay for the sins that you did on earth, but eventually you were released out. And so somebody came up with this brilliant idea, uh, false brilliant idea, that, uh, hey, we could, for money, get people out of this horrible place. And so they would go and they would say, hey, listen, you, if you give some money to the church, that it'll buy somebody out of purgatory, somebody you love, somebody you care about. That is what the selling of indulgences were. And so this, there's one guy who really sent Martin Luther over the top. He was a, his name was Johannes Tietzel, and he was another priest in a town nearby. And he would say, hey, my indulgences 
are so uh, significant that if you buy my indulgences, somebody could even rape the Virgin Mary and they would be uh, freed from purgatory. Martin Luther heard that and he thought, you know what, enough is enough. And so he wrote down that, uh, that pro he said, hey, I have a problem with that. And in fact, he had a problem with 94 other things. 95 things he wrote up, said, I have issues with the church on these things. The selling of indulgences, this getting out of purgatory and all these other things. And he got up one morning, it's Halloween morning. And he went up, this is the day before All Saints Day. So he goes up and he nails these 95 things called theses are their propositions of debate, and he nails them onto the church door, the castle. It was a castle, a castle church. And, and the reason he did that is because that's when everybody came on. The day before All Saints Day, uh, pilgrims from all over would come and look at the relics and then buy these indulgences. And so to help you to remember, I have a mnemonic, okay, and it's built around a little piece of candy, this little Reese's. They're going to be handing these out to you, okay, because... When we think of little candy like this, we think of Halloween, right? So when you, I, I want you to think Halloween day is the 95 theses. And you go, well, how does it get that? Well, this is a little Reese's. Reese's, theses. I was going to give you 95, but I thought you'd get sick to your stomach. But you should be thankful because I could have used the mnemonic feces, and that wouldn't have been good, right? <laughs> so so the, a Reese's is like theses, 95 of these propositions on the Wittenberg door there in Germany. Northern Germany is where that is. Well, Martin Luther did that. He nailed these 95 theses, and the word got out. The word got out to the Pope and to the, to the Holy Roman Empire, the, uh, Charles V. And, the, and this was, these things he was challenging were considered heresy. Now, the punishment for heresy in those days was just simple, just burning at the stake. Okay, that's, and so that's what he was facing. So they summoned him. They said, you are going to come and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, defend your writings, those 95 theses, here in court. So most people thought he wouldn't do that because it was burning at the stake. He went. He traveled there, stood as a commoner. Uh, he was a priest, but he was born just a minor, a minor son. And he was a commoner, stood there in front of Charles V, the emperor, all of these dignitaries, these ecclesiastical uh, hierarchies, and he defended his 95 theses, and he was condemned. He was going to be burned at the stake. Somehow he escaped, and then he lived with his death sentence for the rest of his life. He was so courageous, it just, people looked at it, they were stunned. And this did more for the launching of the Protestant Reformation than anything, anything he ever wrote or believed. However, it is what he wrote and his theology that he believed that affected future generations and transformed the church. And that's what I want to look at. I want to look specifically at three core things that he taught. Uh, but before that, I want to just cover real quickly some of the significant parts of his life uh, six things that I wrote at the top of your outline uh, that, that he really influenced. Number one is that he was the most prolific author in history. You see, the, the uh, printing press had just been developed just a few decades earlier, and really he was just slowly getting ramped up. Well, when Martin Luther comes on the scene, he starts writing. It gets printed up and disseminated out everywhere, and uh, he's by far the most prolific. Seven years from the start of the Reformation, all the way to uh, just for the first seven years, if you were to take the most, the 17 top prolific authors, he had more writings than all of them. 20% of all of the writings uh, he was responsible for, which is an astounding amount for one person. And his Bible that he wrote, one of the things, uh, he, he really sh reshaped the German language. It was all these different dialects. They didn't have television back then. But everybody read his Bible, this Luther Bible, and it, it, it coalesced the country. Everybody spoke the same dialect after that. Second thing is, is the canon, the Old Testament canon. The Bible we use today is the Luther Bible. You see, there was other additional books, seven additional books in the Old Testament. They were written in Greek, not Hebrew, like the rest of the Old Testament. And he looked at that and said, listen, we're going to go to the Jewish Bible, which is the one we currently use, the, the, the 66 books. 
And so the Bible we use today is different than the Bible of his day, different than the Bible that the Catholic Church uses today. Number three, uh, he redefined church practices. In those days, only priests could do certain things. He said, no, no, that all of us have authority in Christ. And some of the examples uh, that, 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 that demonstrate that are with communion. In his day, only a priest could serve communion. And, they believe, and, and the teaching was is that when a priest prayed over communion, it literally transformed into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. It looked like bread, it looked like uh, wine, but it wasn't. He said, no, that's, it's, still, it's still bread and it's still wine. It's, it's, but through faith, something significant happens. He called it the real presence. Something spiritual happened there. Then penance, when a, uh, a sinner would can go into a confessional box and, and say their sins to a priest, the priest had the ability, they, they were teaching, to forgive his sins. He said, no, only God has the the, the ability to forgive sins. We can hear one another and, and sympathize with one another, but forgiveness is only through God. And then this lifting up of saints, really uh, worshiping saints, veneration of saints. Uh, a saint in that, in their definition, was uh, a, a Christian who had did miracles, had died, was canonized by the Pope. And then if you a Christian prayed to a saint, the saint would then go to God for you because you couldn't go directly to God. Martin Luther said, this is not true. You can go through Christ. You can go directly to God for your prayer request. You do not need to go through a saint. And so Luther said, you know, pray, praying to saints is really just pagan idolatry. So these are some of the things that had changed. Then you have all Christians were ministers. It's, he said the priesthood of all believers. We say today in our church that every member is a minister. This is where this comes from. It's from Luther. And this is why we say everybody can get involved in ministry. That's why we offer growth track. We say, hey, get involved in a ministry. This is why it's not good for people just to church hop and shop and, and bounce all around. You get involved, you're, a, you're part of the priesthood. You're part of what God is doing to change and transform the fabric of society. And it happens through a local church. And, he, and, and we're to get involved. You see, at that time, there was this kind of idea that there was sacred jobs that were better, and then these secular jobs, which was everything else. And Luther said, this is not accurate, that all of us are on mission, no matter what we do, and that all work has value and has dignity, all productive work. And, uh, and, and so he says, there's not this big separation of clergy and lady. We're all in this together. We're all, uh, God uses us to impact our world. In 1520, on one of his writings uh, called On the Freedom of a Christian, Luther wrote this, Hence, all of us who believe in Christ are priests and kings in Christ. As 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And then the number five is clergy should be married. See, at that time, they, they were, the church was teaching that if you were a priest, if you were a nun, you were to take this this vow of celibacy, and you cannot get married. Of course, the Catholic Church still teaches that. But he said, no, this is not accurate. We don't see that in Scripture. In fact, the Bible says to be fruitful and multiply. Preachers should marry because then they wouldn't be tempted to sin. In fact, they're given opportunities in being married with their spouse and with kids to develop character and, uh, in ways that are denied a monk. You know, that teaches us, it builds things in our lives. Luther actually said he got married to, quote, spite the devil, which is kind of an odd uh, thing to say to your, you know, your, your fiancé. I'm getting married to spite the devil. Uh, it, it really, did, and, and, and his girl that he decided to marry was a nun, Catherine von Bora. And so the church was shocked. Here's two, a monk and a nun who had, had vows of celibacy now are getting married. But it's really as he looked in Scripture, he said, actually, it's a special, unique gift not to get married. God's sovereign will for most, most, for most people, including pastors and priests, and, are to get married. Now, I personally like this one because I love my wife. I love my kids. The truth is I wouldn't, I wouldn't, have, uh, I wouldn't be here if it, wasn't, if, it, if, it, if, if it wasn't for the influence of, of uh, Martin Luther. I wouldn't have started this church. I wouldn't have been able to marry my kids. I mean, the, 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 w this church exists 
because of the influences of Martin Luther, such as uh, this one where he says, hey, you can get married. It's a good thing. Number six, he invented the modern church service. The, mo the church service of his day, he would go, you know, people would go in. If you went in and you would see, you wouldn't understand hardly anything. Everything was done in Latin, which was not the common vernacular. People didn't read it. They didn't understand it. They didn't speak it. The priest would face uh, the altar. He would not face the congregation. You know, he wore, wore special clothing. And, and, and there was no sermon, no homily. All, it, just, it was like, what is going on here? And so Martin Luther said, no, this is not right. There should, the priest should just wear normal clothing and face the congregation. Certainly everything should be said in the common language, the common vernacular. And that for preaching, he said, hey, let's do an actual Bible teaching. Now, the, what is called the sermon, right? The sermon, I'm, I think the sermon's a cool part of the service. That's where you get to hear some of my corny jokes and all. Just think, if it wasn't for Martin Luther, no jokes. You know, you know some of you might be thinking, well, I don't know. That's a toss-up there, Andy. <laughs> and they didn't have current mics and speakers in the, the sound systems we have today, so they would build these large pulpits that was, was high up. This is actually Martin Luther's pulpit that's been touring the world uh, this past year. But it, would be st it would be high up and in such a way where you could really project somebody's voice without a sound system. So these are some of the things that, were inf that have influenced our church, uh, this church and really churches all over the world because of Martin Luther. Now, let me just real briefly talk about three transformative beliefs they're, they're, and, and they're called the solas because they're, they're, they, it, th that means alone. In other words, th only this alone. And so here's the first one, Scripture alone. When it comes to authority in our lives, it's Scripture alone. We don't find authority in other things. We, it's through God's holy Bible. This is why it's so important. You see, in Luther's day, the Pope would make pronouncements that... Uh, could not be questioned by anyone, called the doctrine of infallibility, as well as the Pope, but also throughout the ages, sometimes uh, there was like these traditions that would be collected, such as praying to saints, or the worship of the Virgin Mary, selling of indulgences, this idea of giving money to the church and you buy somebody out of this purgatory hell. And, and these traditions started to become equal with scripture they weren't even in the bible but yet just they they became equal and at, at the same authority level and martin luther said this is not good this is not right so he said it's only scripture alone not these other things and not the popes uh, it's 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 if we can't find it in scripture then uh there's a problem in fact in that day they would the, the uh congregants weren't even expected to read the bible they were discouraged to read the bible only a priest should read the bible you come to church, and so people's exposure to any Bible verses was only at church. Now, it's interesting that 500 years later, today, Christianity Today recently polled Christians, and they found 80% of Christians in America only read their Bible once a week at church. I guess we've gone full circle, right? We're back to where we were 500 years ago. But that's not God's will. God's desire, because it's our authority in life, is that we read the Bible ourselves. We don't have to have somebody else teach us. And we read it and let God speak to us, and it's the authority in our lives. This is what so many Christians have, have, uh, have, have even died for, to translate the Bible into our common language. We certainly have many, many translations, but all over the world there's translations, and people have gone and paid huge, uh, a huge cost, sometimes even their life, in order to translate the Bible. That's why it's so important. We're in a small group. We're reading the Bible. That's why it's so important that at home, when you get up in the morning, and it's so easy. I mean, sometimes I think we almost take it, take it for granted. It's just right there on our little, uh, on our mobile phone. It's free download. It doesn't get any easier. All of the, which language, which translation do I want? In English, we have like, what, 25 or 30, right? Hmm, I have this one. But it's God's authority in our life. We want to let God speak into our life, and it happens through his word. Now, notice here, John, when he's writing, some people were trying to lead people away from Jesus. And he says this, he says, As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. Now, he's not saying we don't need pastors 
to help expound the word, but he is saying that if somebody tries to deceive you or lead you away from God, you can use the Bible to help keep you grounded. You yourself, you read the Bible, you get it, and you stay grounded in God's word for your life. If you're humble, if you pray prayerfully go to God with the Bible, he will reveal to you what his word is for you. Luther elevates this, the, the literal reading of the Bible and its power in your life. Notice, notice he, Paul says something. He says, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that all, so that all God's people may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the Bible carries with it authority, authority in our lives. We are to read it and to, uh, and to apply it in our lives. You're saying, well, Andy, are you saying that I'm supposed to use the Bible literally? You mean uh, everything, uh, I'm, everything in creation and the dietary rules and the commandments, all of that you're saying I'm supposed to literally apply to my life and, have, and it has authority in my life? Well, yes, it, that's true. But Sometimes this is the part that gets confusing for people. You see, the Bible, sometimes you'll hear, you know, the Bible is the owner's manual for life, and I understand what they're trying to get at, but sometimes that really is, is a harmful illustration at some level because if we all have, like, owner's manuals to our car, right? How often do you read that? Not very often, right? It's not recreational reading. Hey, what are you reading? Oh, my owner's manual. What? You know, so, that, and, but sometimes that's the way we try to approach it. You know, I'm having problems with doubts. Oh, well, go to my owner's manual. It's on page, you know, 13. Oh, I'm having, what, what's my right belief on the end times? Oh, that's on page 32. You know, my owner's manual in the Bible, you know. Oh, well, what do I do about to fix my kid? Oh, well, that's from pages 8 to page 949, you know. <laughs> I got a lot of reading on that. <laughs> Have you noticed that the Bible is not really organized that way? It's not organized like that with just, Here's all these commands and all these lists. The Bible is organized like a story. Not just because stories are easier for us to get, but because it is, life is a story. It's an, un, it's an unfolding story of redemption. And if we try to take things out of context without understanding the story, then it doesn't make sense. It gets confusing. It gets difficult to understand. Let me give you an example. Uh, uh, back in um, World War II, you had um, a bunch of, of, of rules and beliefs. Was this wrong? Was this right? What's the best way to do this? Uh, you had, um, you had uh, uh, distribution of, of supplies and, you, you know, signing up for the draft. You had all kinds of, of rules and regulations. Uh, uh, you had food vouchers. But there's also, there was a story that was part of that. And this bow tie wearing, cigar chomping Prime Minister Winston Churchill would talk about the story. Now, let me read to you a portion of what he said at one point. He said, upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. If we can stand, all Europe may be, per, may be free and the life of the world may, be forward, may move forward and do broad sunlit uplands. Pretty cool words, right? And he goes on, but if we fail, then the whole world and all that we have known and cared for will sink into the abyss of a new dark age. Let us therefore so bear ourselves that if the British Empire lasts a thousand years, men still will say this was their finest hour. People would hear that. Now, other great words, no doubt, very eloquent, but it wasn't the words that people were willing to give their lives for. It was the story. It was the narrative. They said, I'm willing to give my life to that. Not just a bunch of rules and regulations. It was the story. That's a great story. I want to be part of that. And World War II, that story, as well as every other story, falls into the story of God's story. God's great redemptive story. And, and that's how we find meaning. That's how regulations and rules find their meaning. It's, oh, I see how it fits in. So when we're taking something literally, it's all it's understanding the context of it. For example, the World War II story again. I mean, uh, in May 1945, the Germans had surrendered. 
And so the Allies started changing their, instead of killing Germans, now they're helping Germans. They're feeding Germans. They're shipping in butter and bread and all kinds of things. The war's still going on. Japan's still fighting. So if somebody were to look back and not take that into consideration, they would look and they'd go, golly, this is kind of odd. I mean, sometimes the Allies are killing Germans. Sometimes they are helping them. I guess they're just picking and choosing. They just do whatever they want. See, because they didn't get the whole story. This is true in the Bible. When we're looking at things, commandments and regulations and rules, it has a context. And so we recognize that and we realize that the writers of the Bible, uh, other than be, besides being inspired, which they were, were also smart people. And God is at work in revealing his, 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 his word to us. And so that is what it means to take the Bible literally and allow the authority of, of, of God's word into our lives. We, we reread it. We recognize this is God's authority and, and there's a story, a narrative, and we belong in that. And that's how me, that life finds meaning. Life ultimately finds real meaning when we find our narrative in God's greater narrative. Number two, another alone. First one was the Bible alone. Second one is faith in Christ alone. Faith in Christ alone. That is all you need for salvation. In Luther's day, they taught that works was how you get to heaven. Works, that you do good works, that you do kind things, that you're a moral and upstanding person. And if you tally those up enough over your lifetime, and it outweighs the bad stuff you did, you got a good shot at going to heaven. And Luther looked at that, he said, this is not the, what we see in Scripture at all. None of us will ever be good enough. He said, it's only through faith in Christ. And he pointed to this verse here in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. You can't just boast that you do a bunch of good works. There's nothing, all of us kind of, we're far from being able to make it into heaven without faith in Christ. This idea was so transformative for Luther that he changed his name. That's how he got his name, Luther. His surname uh, that he was born into, his dad's surname was Luther, which actually had this idea in German of looseness and immorality. And so he changed his name to Luther, which means the freed one, the one who's freed because of the grace of God, which is how he got his name, uh, Martin Luther. He changed it to that. In uh, Romans 3.28, kind of his signature verse that changed Martin Luther, he said, it says there, For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. That was so significant. When he wrote the Luther Bible, his translation of German, he added the word alone so that it read this, For we now maintain that man becomes justified without the works of the law through faith alone. Faith alone in Christ. It's faith. It's not uh, trusting in popes, trusting in angels, trusting in saints. It's certainly not trusting in our good works. It is trusting in Christ. In, in Christ. Now, there's other verses like James. James comes along and he talks about good works playing a vital role. Notice what he says here. And this relationship to works to faith. He says, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. See, he's quoting the same verse. He, they're talking about the same, the same passage in the Old Testament. And he says, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. It almost seems like Paul and James are talking, uh, uh, have two different views here of faith and works. But really what's going on is, is that James is talking about a, the kind of faith that we have, the kind of faith. You see, faith that's rooted in Christ naturally produces good works, but it's faith that saves us. It's faith that saves us. And this happens to us when, uh, all the time when we are kind of, our faith is really tested. What is it that we really believe? What is it really that we really believe? A good example of this is Moses and Aaron after the burning bush. They come back to tell the Israelites, hey, listen, you're going to be freed 
uh, because God's going to come and deliver you. You've been in slavery 400 years. You're going to be freed. And they're like, they're pumped. Yeah, this is awesome. We want to leave. Uh, The Israelites say, and they believed, it says. And and when they heard that, the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery. They bowed down and worshiped him. So this is... This is their response. They hear it, they go, yeah, let's go. A few chapters later, the, the Israelites are now uh, blocked in. They're at the Red Sea, they can't get through. And the Pharaoh has decided, you know, I don't want to lose my workforce after all. So he chases him with chariots. He it looks like he's going to come and kill him. They're hemmed in. And now they change their tune. It says here, they say this. Was it because there was no graves in Egypt? They're talking to Moses. Was it that there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians? Now, is that what they said? We just read what they said. Is that what they said? No, they didn't say that, right? But when the crisis comes, all of a sudden, what we think we believe in a place of convenience, a place of ease in our life, when it's tested, it's really not what we believe. I mean, this happens to us, right? I mean, we'll say, we read in the Bible, Jesus says, hey, don't worry about your finances, don't worry about what you wear, your clothing, uh, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. And we go, I believe that. I'm not worried about my finances. I'm not worried about my possessions. And then we lose our job or the economy goes south. We start losing money and then all of a sudden we're freaking out. We are all filled with anxious and worry. Right? And so it turns out that that we're not worried about money as long as we have what? Money. As long as we got some, we're not worried about it when we start to lose it. And then, oh no. Because it's easy to say something when things are convenient and say, oh, that's what I believe. But the truth is when the test and the fire comes, that's really what you believe. You see, I can say uh, a whole bunch of things about what I believe, and I can even think I believe something, but you actually know better of what I believe by the way I act. You look at my behaviors, that is really what I believe. No matter what I say, no matter what I think I believe. And this is true with you as well. And this is what James is getting at. He's saying there's a substance of faith that needs to be attested and evaluated because that is what you really believe. Now, the good news is you don't need a lot of faith. It's just, it's the right, it's a a little bit of faith in the right thing. A little bit of faith in Christ. Christ is the one who sustains me. I mean, those, if you know the story, the, the Israelites, God did deliver them. He did open up the Red Sea there's like a wall of water on either side. It's dry ground, the Bible says. They're, and you can, you can imagine these Israelites, they're booking their way down. They look back, Pharaoh's not going to get them. Now, you know, just because of human nature, some people probably responded differently. Some people were probably going, <laughs> you know, you chump Pharaoh, you sucker. You know, they're like trash talking Pharaoh. Other people probably are a little more timid. And they're going, oh no, look at these walls. We could die at any moment. But all of them were saved. Because it wasn't the strength of their faith, it was what their faith was pointed towards. And see, when we put our faith in Christ, it's always enough to get us into heaven. It's enough to change our eternities. And so it's the Bible alone. That's our sole authority. It's Christ alone and then glory to God alone. The Glory to God alone. See, there was a cult practice in Luther's day with the Roman Catholic Church worshiping Mary, the mother of Jesus, praying to saints, giving excess praise and veneration to popes and to ecclesiastical hierarchy. And so Luther said, no, no, glory goes only to God. Psalmist, the psalmist writes there in, in Psalm 19, he says, this heavens declare the glory of God. See, all of creation declares the glory of God. Today, you know, in our, in our enlightenment, understanding often we look at that verse and we go oh see creation proves the existence of God but that's really not what the psalmist had in mind because in those days everybody believed in God what he's saying is is that when we look at creation it reflects something about the nature of God how great God is how majestic he is the splendor of God when we look at that when we look at his creation it says something about the creator Basically, if you like the creation, wait till you get to know the creator. That's the kind of creator that he is. And so glory is this word of weight, a word that 
reflects something of the nature. The glory of a flower is its beauty. The glory of a strong man is his strength. The glory of, you know, a beautiful sunset or a waterfall or a baby bottlenose dolphin or a wonderfully thrown curveball. If you love that, you're going to love the creator because there's great, it says everything about the creator. Look at here what the psalmist says in Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Every person has a name, a character. And so God's name is, is this, this glory. And he says, worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. So we're to worship God. Now, some people look at that and they go, well, what's all this thing where God wants worship? He's wanting us to give him glory. Is he, is he real needy or something? I mean, what's, what's up with that? Is he, is he uh, does he have a weak ego? And so he needs everybody to tell him how great he is? Well, this is a misunderstanding of, 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 of glory because when we understand glory, glory is something that we participate with. When you see something miraculous, when you see something marvelous, you want to tell somebody, right? You see, you know, you see a, a, something just a majestic and you want to you go tell somebody. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, for, this is for, all, for the single guys here. Okay, if you see a, a single woman, okay, single guys, okay, if you see a single woman who's gloriously beautiful and magnetically winsome, who do you want to tell? Okay, maybe that's why you're single. Let's, <laughs> I'm going to kind of dial this back a little bit, give you, okay, this is free advice, okay? If you, if you're, if you see an available girl and, and, and you see her and she's, just gloriously beautiful and magnetically winsome, you want to tell her, right? You want to tell her, you tell her, and if she receives your praise, if she receives those, uh, that attention, and she reciprocates and in you know, in, 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 invites you into her life, you get to share in that beauty and that glory. You get to share, in, maybe in, in, the, in a beautiful, strange way, you get to be part of all of that beauty. And you see, God designed us in such a way where we're supposed to share in God's glory with him. And, and it, it's all about having glory radar detectors, recognizing where should glory go? What, what, is, the, what, what is God really like? And when we sing and when we recognize who he is, we're entering into that. We get to enter into this, this exchange of walking out the story with him. It's a profound, amazing thing we get to be part of. God summons us. He says, hey, I want you to be part of what I'm doing here. The problem is there's this thing that gets in the way called sin. It, it separates us from God's glory. The Bible says for all have fallen short of the glory of God. All, all of us. So we're all in the same boat, unfortunately, and we've fallen short, there's glory, and we're kind of separated, and so we try to get self-glory, and we get misaligned glory. We're always looking for it, because we're, we're, we were designed for that, to share in God's glory with Him. And from days of old, the prophets would say, there will be a day when you will, the glory will spread over all of the earth. The last verse on your outline talking about Jesus. He says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. This is, this is Jesus as the waters come cover the sea. This is what we're invited into where God says, I want you to have the knowledge of my glory. I want you to be able to enter in and participate and see your story and the greater story that God is unfolding in this world. We get to be part of that. We might be feel, maybe you feel distant from God. And today he's inviting you and saying, come share my glory. Come be part of what I'm doing. So you just humbly come and you pray. So let's do that right now. Let's bow our heads and pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, right now I just pray for your presence right here, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This is, it's a holy moment, but it's really, we're, we're recognizing this this uh, significant time 
that really impacts us if we allow it. Luther talked about Scripture alone and faith in Christ alone. Glory to God alone. It's impacted lives and eternities for centuries. But does that really matter if it doesn't impact our lives? God wants you to encounter his word. For it to have authority in your life. Some of you need to say, God, enough is enough. Today, I'm going to start reading the Bible regularly, prayerfully, not, does, not with resentment, not, oh gosh, this is my duty. God wants to speak to you, reveal his word in a powerful way. Some of you need to say, this is, my, this is my next step. Some of you, it's faith in Christ. If you feel apart from God, maybe you're far from God. God's asking you to come home. This is your opportunity. This is your moment. You invite Jesus Christ into your life. Would you just say, dear God, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. That he died on the cross for me. That he rose from the dead to empower me, to free me. So today, I put my life in your hands. Would you pray that? Say, God, I, I, faith in Christ alone. It's not about what, how many good works I can do. It's about faith in you. Some of you, when I was talking about standing there in the bottom of the Red Sea and looking around the wall saying, how long will this thing last? It will last. It's not about your faith because it's the substance of, the, of what you put your faith in. Christ will get you through. And then, Lord, we give you glory. Help us to have glory detectors. Say, yes, I want to give the recognition to God. I look at his creation. I look at some amazing things in the world, and that just talks about the nature of the creator. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.